Please welcome to the stage, Chris Roberts. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's probably a bit early for all us game developer style people, but uh, I'm glad you got out here early. Uh, I hope you like what you saw. That um, I'm actually pretty proud of it because it was all rendered in the game engine and using the game asset. So that uh, it was the sort of thing that we could only do in pre-rendered sequences. And not that long ago when I did the Wing Commander movie, we had to have million, uh, millions of dollars of SGI machines to do that. And that was all done on a PC with a GTX 670 in real time, which is pretty cool. Um, and in case you don't believe me, we're going to jump into the game engine uh, a little later on, and I'm going to sort of show you some stuff in it and uh, show you some stuff that I think is pretty cool. Uh, but um, before then, I thought I would uh, have a little conversation with you and tell you uh, why I'm coming back, kind of why I, I uh, uh, took a little bit of a break, and uh, I'll sort of tell you the big picture of the game that, um, you know, this past year I've been in sort of super secret uh, pre-production and prototyping, which is what you've uh, seen here. And, uh, and, and sort of tell you about kind of what I'm planning to build and hopefully uh, 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 invite you guys to be part of that process uh, going forward. So let me uh, get my super handy uh, clicker here to move this on. Um, so, you know, I, I think you guys know that uh, uh, when I sold Digital Anvil to Microsoft back in uh, the end, uh, the very beginning of 2001, uh, I took a break from the, uh, the game business. Uh, it was, uh, there was several reasons, but uh, one of the big ones was that I was sort of frustrated with the technology of being able to realize sort of the picture of the vision I had in my head. Uh, and then also there was the in ever increasing development cycle. So, uh, you know, most of the wink manners I made were I built in about a year or 18 months. Uh, but uh, freelancer, we were sort of four years into production. And, uh, you know, I, <laughs> Microsoft bought the company and it was still another two years before it came out. So, sort of six years between releasing and uh, people getting to uh, play the game that you've been working on sort of was feeling too long. And uh, I was fairly frustrated with that. And then, uh, and then there was also just an element of the business was getting sort of big and corporate. And you had to be more about being part of a big company. And uh, I sort of enjoy making games. And so uh, I sort of felt like I wanted to take a break. But it didn't mean that I uh, didn't love games. And actually, the interesting thing is I probably got to play a lot more games when I stopped making them. because. I had some more spare time, um, so I, you know, I've always been playing games. I've always had the, uh, you know, the, the newest PC with the newest graphics card and the cons, you know, whatever the new console is. Uh, and uh, you know, a couple of years ago was sort of the first time that I was playing games and feeling like, you know, I actually have something to say again, and I'd like to come back and and and, and make a game. And I sort of felt uh, playing it on a couple of things. One, I sort of felt like the technology had moved forward to a point, and also I could see where it was going to go, that uh, you could do stuff in terms of the, the visual fidelity that would just increase the immersion. And so for me, you know, all the games I've ever built are always about creating a world and a rich, rich, rich texture. And, and to do that, you have to sort of realize it with a, a fair amount of detail. And, and uh, I think you know, and today, especially if you're focusing on a high-end PC, which I'm doing, um, you can you can sort of do that to a level that just sort of sucks you into the world, and I think you know that's actually one of the things when I was doing films, I sort of you know you sort of learn is that the, there's a huge attention to detail, right? So even a, a film set in today's world, you know half the time you think those were shot in lo real locations, but usually they were actually sets that were built, and they have a whole art department, and they've got people that you know figuring out how to put the little scratches, the ticks. You know, uh, you know, little uh, rivets on the walls and everything, just down to the finest detail. So when you watch it, you think it's real and you get sucked into it. And I think that's something that, uh, in you know, in it, when you're building a world or a game, the more of that you have into it, I think it helps. I mean, I, I definitely, you know, one of the games that I liked a lot um, a few years ago was, uh, you know, Uncharted 2. And I think they, you know, they did a great job. It wasn't so much that the gameplay itself was wholly original because it's you know, sort of an evolution of Tomb Raider and, and a third uh, cover shooter. But the texture of it and the world and the detail, I was completely immersed in. I was, and so at that point, I was lost, and it was great. And so any, you know, the, the, the technology being able to let you do that now is sort of, I think, one of the big reasons. And the other uh, reason for me that I'm sort of excited to, to come back and make games again is I sort of feel like with the shift to digital and the way that you can sort of be connected to your um, 
community of people that are playing the games that you make, uh, I think that's incredibly exciting. I mean, I think one, you know, I was saying one of my frustrations in the old days was that you know, you'd work for many years on a game, and then you would put it on a disc, and then it would go on a box, and it would go out to the store, and then people would buy it, and hopefully they liked it, and then it would all be over for after a month, and then you would start it all over again, and there'll be another two, three years before you would get to do that again. And, and that, uh, you know, if you're a creative person, that's kind of kind of gets frustrating, especially the longer it gets. And I think in today's world, when you sort of can be connected and you can sort of uh, build a world that you know maybe people are playing all the time and there's constant updates, that it's a totally different equation. And I think that you have much more instant feedback. And uh, I think from a, from my standpoint, anyway, I think it's uh, it's it's incredibly exciting and uh, it's kind of fun. I mean, I don't know how many of the people in here went on the the sort of early teaser site that we that we put up about 30 days ago. But you know, even on that site, we have been doing two to three content updates a day. Uh, you know, and it's kind of fun. You're sort of doing it live, and you're seeing what people are saying when you put stuff up. And uh, you know, I really sort of feel like that's something that is fun and will be great to. Uh, explore going forward, and so that was one of the, the sort of core uh, tenets of me saying, "Hey, I want to come back and I want to do something to that direction." So here we go. Press my little button. So what am I going to build? So I'm going to build uh, a universe, and the, the sort of name of the universe or the the, the, the community I'm talk, uh, talking about is going to be called Star Citizen, and it's Star Citizen because, uh, well, citizenship is very important in this universe. You don't automatically uh, get it, you have to earn it, so you can earn it uh, via military duty, like the sort of cinematic uh, teaser that we just showed is from the sort of military side of it, um, or you could earn it by performing uh, missions that would increase your civic standing, or you could just be you know, an entrepreneur, a merchant, earn a lot of money and, and buy your citizenship. And of course, in this universe, you don't necessarily have to be a citizen. In fact, if you were a pirate or sort of on the sort of grayer side of law and order, you may not want to be a citizen. But the idea is that there's sort of uh, something that you can attain and work to towards. And, and also, I like the idea of citizenship because I sort of feel like one of the things I want to do with this game is I want to say, hey, you know what? You know, PC, PC games are cool. Space games are cool. And you know, I think it's kind of a community. And, I, and I've definitely seen it in the sort of Wing Commander uh, uh, fan community. I've seen it in the freelancer fan community. And I sort of feel like. Uh, yeah, I, I, I sort of want to pull a community together and, and then sort of build a great universe and, and have that ongoing uh, sort of relationship and people will be citizens of this um, universe. It'll be hopefully very cool. Um, but the, you know, the base uh, gameplay in, in Star Citizen is it's, it's going to be you know, the style of game that I've built in the past, which is sort of space combat and adventuring um, in a persistent open universe. Uh, so the way I'm looking at it is I sort of want to make one holistic universe that encompasses uh, everything that was great about Privateer and Freelancer, but also what works with uh, that was great about Wing Commander. And so I want you to be able to sort of experience all those things. So it's sort of like you're in a universe that doesn't stop um, going forward and happening and is, is a sort of constantly live. Uh, but you, know, you want to play your single player uh, you know, story campaign off on the side. You can absolutely do it. So sort of the idea is, uh, in this universe, for instance, you can sign up for your military duty, which is one of the ways to earn citizenship. And that, in essence, is playing the single-player uh, story narrative campaign that's the Wing Commander experience. And that's the typical branching uh, mission uh, setup that you would have in Wing Commander, because, of course, if you're in the military, you can't just sort of take off and fly off to another planet. It's like you'd be going AWOL. Uh, so, but you, the idea is, is, is that particular uh, experience we're calling Squadron 42, uh, which was sort of what that cinematic trailer was about. And uh, you know, the 42nd um, Squadron of the Imperial Navy in this universe is sort of a legendary fighting unit. It's very much like the uh, French Foreign Legion. In fact, that it's always in the toughest areas, you know, trying to hold back the sort of alien uh, hordes that are threatening humanity, and they, you know, somehow manage to pull out in. You know, against all the odds, and and to actually be accepted into this squadron is a is a pretty huge deal, and sort of gives you a sort of certain level of uh, I don't know, status. It would be like being a Navy SEAL or something. So uh, the the uh, the goal of the of the, the the narrative campaign is that you fight the the battles very much in a sort of Wing Commander one, Wing Commander two narrative uh, branching style, and then if you manage to succeed at the end, you'll be invited into the squadron, and then when you finish that, you'll be able to muster out. You'll have some 
credits in your pocket, and you'll sort of have the status of being uh, you know, an ex-member of uh, the 42nd Squadron, and there's a sort of community of sort of ex-members in the universe, and, and uh, you know, then you go out and make your, make your fortune in the universe, and you know, we may, you know, we'll do another story campaign in a little bit, just much like the Wing Commander mission packs, and you could always re-up for another Tour of Duty. Um, and then, so you have that, which is sort of the Wing Commander experience, and then you have sort of the privateer freelancer experience, which is the typical, you can fly around, venture, you know, buy goods, sell it, trade, be a merchant, be a pirate, be a mercenary, it's sort of up to you. Uh, and you know, obviously the goal in that is to sort of build up your wealth and your ship and your capabilities. Uh, so you know, eventually there'll be some real estate that you'll be able to buy. But essentially, that's hopefully going to be a, 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 an ongoing um, environment that is always changing and, and uh, adapting. And so I'll get to the next slide. Uh, I already talked about Squadron 42. I always get ahead of myself on these slides. Hang on, one more forward. Um, so one of, one of the keys, and I, and I talked about it in, uh, you know, back when we were doing Freelancer, was that uh, I wanted to have sort of a dynamic universe that reacted to the players. And uh, you know, I talked about it uh, when we first announced the game in 1999. And unfortunately, a lot of those features didn't end up happening because it was sort of that was the stage two, and uh, you know it was released in 2003, and and, and uh, you know Microsoft sort of started to focus on Xbox games and not so much PC games anymore. Um, and uh, so I, I've always wanted to feel like I wanted to, to finish that off and do it, uh, you know, the way I wanted to do it. Uh, you know, I think uh, the CCP guys did a very nice job with uh, what they did on Eve Online, but it's not the style of uh, game that, you know, the first person sort of visceral uh, wing commander, privateer, freelancer style. Uh, so that's really important. The other aspect of it is not just a sort of dynamic uh, economy, but it's also to have a universe that sort of reacts to what's happening, in, uh, you know, what the player base is doing out there. So there's several ways that we're going to achieve it. Uh, one of the key ways is that we're going to do sort of micro content updates. So one of the core goals of this universe is not to have uh, a big sort of monolithic content update every one year or two years, uh, like you see in sort of some of the bigger MMOs, is to sort of have small updates once once a week or once every two weeks uh, that are constantly adding things. So like one. Uh, you know, one week you may add a star system over here. A couple of weeks later, you'll do you know, a five-mission story path over on another side of the galaxy. And uh, the idea is that you've got a content team that's doing that, and you're sort of uh, behaving a little like an, uh, an old-school dungeon master in D&D, where you sort of, yes, you have an overall goal of where you're going to go, but you're riffing off kind of what's happening out there and what the players are doing. So you're sort of riding into uh, your stories or changing things around a little bit. Uh, so it's sort of so the people that are playing feeling like their actions actually have some impact. Uh, you know, or another way to think about it is if you think about the uh, TV model versus the film model. Um, so you know, I think that the sort of open world uh, style of game is closer to a TV model than a, the film model. And that, what I mean is, you know, if people, if someone does a TV series, what they do is they write a Bible and they write five or six episodes and then they broadcast it. And then if it's well received, then they get an order from the network and they get to do lots more episodes. But what happens is the writing team on that sort of writing as the episodes have been seen and they kind of know what the audience likes. So that's why when you see shows, a lot of times you'll see characters get killed off or some characters get bigger roles. Uh, and uh, that's, that's kind of what you can do in TV that you say can't do in features because you're sort of live with what's happening. And uh, I think that also can be very applicable to sort of an open world and a, and a, and a, a universe uh, that I'm trying to build. And I think it can be really great. And to give an example of, say, something else that would be connecting for the people playing this universe. So I mentioned that we would have a star system that would uh, would put in the galaxy. Well, uh, we wouldn't actually tell the player base that this we put a new jump point, a new star system in. And in fact, it would have to be a, the player, a player that's playing it would have to discover it. So uh, it basically would be an uncharted jump point. And you know, if you've got certain equipment on your ship, or you tend to be someone that wants to be more an explorer, um, you know, you would be flying near a star, and you would sort of see that there would be this sort of gravitational anomaly, and you would you'd realize it's an uncharted jump point, and then you could choose to to actually chart and fly the jump point, which isn't particularly, which is difficult. Like, I don't know, it'd be like, uh, you know, riding a you know an incredibly uh, gnarly wave on the north shore of you know uh, in Hawaii somewhere, and um, if you manage to get to the other side, then your nav computer has recorded all your moves, and then you can sell it 
at a, at a great profit back to one of the space corporations that will then just be able to sell it to all the players, and they'll automatically be able to jump that nav point. But the really cool thing is that you'll get to name the star system or the, or the nav point um, after yourself. So you know, players that discover the new jump points in the star systems will actually become part of the universe. They'll sort of have, they'll, uh, and I think that's kind of cool. I think just becoming that sort of viral discovery and uh, you know, becoming part of the fabric of the universe is, is, uh, is, uh, is actually really cool. And, uh, and so those aspects, I think, are going to make the universe really interesting. Um, and then the other thing that um, is important is I think the multiplayer aspect, uh, if done right, really is something you can do today that I couldn't have done uh, 10 years ago. And uh, you know, so we're going to do you know, several things. First of all, even on the single player side, uh, the Squadron uh, 42 side of it, uh, we're going, you can play the single player offline. Single player, you don't have to be online for it. But if you do play it online, your friends can jump in and, uh, and, and essentially sort of be wingmen during missions. And I don't know if many people here have played Demon's Souls, but it was, uh, it was actually a game that I quite liked. But they had a really great approach to the way they were sort of handling this sort of single player slash multiplayer. And you know, when you went to take out one of the bosses, uh, you know, people could help you out and join you in, and they would get some bonus and points for it. But we'll definitely sort of have a really cool multiplayer on the, on the sort of campaign narrative side. And then in the open world, uh, we're sort of focusing a lot on uh, you know, how you and your friends uh, can fly together. And so you know, like an example would be if you're flying from one planet to another planet and you get attacked along the way, you get you know, sort of put out into you know, what we call a battle instance. And in this battle instance, um, we will always save slots for friends of whoever's in the battle instance. So you can sort of put a distress call to your friends list. And if they're close by, they can sort of warp in and help you out. So it's sort of like calling in the cavalry. So think of it like you know, if you ever play World of Tanks or Battlefield, you know, if you get online and you see your friends playing in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an instance, uh, you can jump into it, but you know sometimes they're all full up. Well, what we're sort of saying is we're we're building it in such a way that we're, we'll we'll always reserve slots for friends so they can come in. And then on top of that, um, what we're going to do is, and I'll show you we'll, when when I'll get into it, I'll show you some of the technology. But we've spent a lot of time building. Uh, a technology so it's sort of scalable on a spaceship size, so we can handle the small spaceships like a fighter craft that you're flying, but we can also handle much bigger spaceships. So in that trailer you're seeing that you're flying off a big carrier. Well, that's a that's simulated and modeled as a vehicle, just like uh, the fighters are, and we can be anywhere in between that. So in this in this sort of open world universe, you'll be able to sort of buy or fly around a bigger ship. So think uh, a Millennium Falcon style ship where you can. Have you know you'll have the cockpit and you'll have some turrets and some corridors inside it and you could be flying it and you can have a few of your friends hanging out on your ship as you're flying through the galaxy. So you can say, hey, go, we're going to fly on a difficult mission. Will you man the turrets for me? Uh, and uh, you know a few of the bigger ones will even have a small hangar bay that will have a fighter in. So if you come under attack, someone can jump in the fighter, someone can jump man the turrets and, and fly around. So that's always something I've wanted to do uh, in a game and and you can do it now. And so we're going to be doing that in this. Um, so those are all features I think are pretty uh, cool. And let's go on to the next slide. I guess we'll all need you to enlist here. But um, so I'm going to jump into the game now, because I want to sort of show uh, uh, this, is, this is sort of the prototype level that we spent about a year uh, sort of working the workflows and some of the technical issues out. But I want to sort of show some of, the, some of the, the aspects of it and also show you that what you saw in that, that, that uh, movie was actually Game assets. Okay, so you're up here. So I'm actually on the bridge of that carrier and uh, walk around. I guess I'll. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, fell down too many stairs. Down more stairs. Um, I guess if I go out the side here, I can sort of show you. Uh, see out onto the, the actual main carrier there. But I'm going um, to cheat and sort of walk myself to the hangar bay really quickly. So here I'm sort of on the hangar bay. And so one of the things that uh, is, uh, you know, I'm kind of happiest with, that the, the sort of level of fidelity that we're doing here. I'll sort of look, we'll spin around. But um, so, you know, so my, 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 my pilot character here. So he's built out of about 100,000 faces, so, so a typical 
current gen console game will have about 10,000 faces for a main character. So the difference you get with this is you get you know, all this extra sort of piping and tubing and detail and creases and nuances that you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to get in uh, uh, you know, a, a current gen style game. And then also if I'm looking around in the, uh, if I'm looking around here in the, the, uh, the hangar bay, um, you, you know, the, the level of sort of detail, oops, oh, that's good. And prototype was still working, but um, you're look, looking around here in the level of detail. But the actual uh, hangar itself is about uh, just under about two million polys, and uh, you know each one of the, these uh, ships themselves. If we go take a look at, them, I'll get into one to fly. They're about three hundred thousand. So the ships that's again about ten x what you have in a current gen uh, console game, and you know it just allows you to have a lot more detail, sort of the paneling and the stuff, and it all holds up really close. Um, but I'm sort of I'm going to go and get into my fighter. Style in, and yeah, it's it wouldn't be got to have a cockpit. It's got to be real. It's got to be detailed. Um, so you know, this is kind of what I'm talking about: the level of immersion. I mean, I think I actually was uh, kind of regretted in Wing Commander 4 that we cut the cockpits out mainly just because we didn't have the time to to uh, get them all done. But um, yeah, I mean, the whole thing is modeled fully in 3D. And uh, you know, everything that you do, and I'll, I'll get out and sort of show it here in a bit, but uh, uh, you know, everything you're doing will be mimicked inside the cockpit. But, uh, try not to kill ourselves. Again, so like, you know, so I was walking around this cockpit, uh, which is actually I'll go here. Uh, try not to normally play at this angle, but um, it's again the le it's exactly the same. When I was talking about the level of fidelity. So you know the ship itself, and actually if we fly past, you'll see inside the bridge there is like that was the bridge I was wandering around with. And if we get past, let's see if I get it. Um, uh, see all the, the folks in it or not. It's kind of hard. I don't want. Oops! I'm going to hit this side. That probably won't be so good. Um, but the idea, I mean, like the idea would be in the multiplayer side. You literally could be sitting in that bridge, and a friend of yours could get out in a fighter and fly around, and you, know, you could wave to each other. And uh, it's all done at that level. So if you sort of notice, you know, there wasn't any loading screen. It all holds up. I'm there in first person or third person at that level of fidelity, and then I get into my uh, cockpit, and you know, I've got, you know, uh, let's find some light to show on it because this is space so uh, uh, there's light but um, so yeah like I'm in my cockpit so if you think Wing Commander style you know I move my joystick you can see me do everything I can see my feet on the pedals moving back and forth um, foot on the, the you know the, the throttle um, you know and if I'm changing something around you'll see my thumb so every action that you're going to do in the in the final game you'll actually do. You'll see your character do it. He flips the switch. You want to turn on it. You want to turn the weapons display on. You'll have to switch. Your character will actually have to switch, and it will come out. So it's all about making you feel immersive. It's sort of like the next st step of what a long time ago I did in Wing Commander, where I put you in the cockpit. And instead of saying you were 52% damaged, it was like you would see the cockpit smoking. You would feel that. But of course, you know that was much more primitive. It was VGA 320 by 200. This is 1080p with you know millions of colors. Um, but it's just, it's, you know, part of it's the level of detail and immersion. If I sort of come out on the ship itself, it's the same. It, it's like, just, just like li little things. So, you know, like silly things. But, you know, if I'm like moving my laser gatlings around, the, the wires are all deforming. And uh, if I'm flying, you'll sort of see my uh, vector thrust on the back that all, it's all sort of moving. Um, and let's see if I go up here, um, show us a few things. Uh, but the idea is, you know, this like all the all the craft that you you um, you fly uh, are modeled to this sort of level of fidelity. So you know, this particular fighter has about 300 parts, and about 60 plus of them are all sort of moving. Um, and uh, so let's see what I'm doing if I'm uh, a little bit. Uh, Classic Star Wars st style stuff. But uh, if we go in here, I'll sort of also deploy my missile bays. And the same thing, you can sort of fire, fire the missiles. Uh, fire, see the side. And they're actually all set up very much like a, a real missile would be. So there's an explosive force, and they go out, and then it sort of hits the acceleration. But it's all sort of the, the aspect of uh, 
sort of you know the realism. I mean, the same thing. You know, I, sort of can, I can sort of punch in, and you know, it's like a level of detail that you know typically um, you haven't sort of seen before um, in uh, you know at least a, definitely a console game. It's what you can do on a high-end PC. But um, let's see if I'm getting, I'm getting closer. Play a little bit. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just you know, it's just if you want to come in right up really close, it's going to hold up all the way in really close. And then if you want to come out wide, I mean, it's the same thing and the same on the, the carrier. The carrier itself was, uh, you know, I think uh, the carrier itself is about seven million polys, where this is about three hundred thousand. Uh, so it's just all, you know, that's all what you can do when you're sort of going crazy on the. Uh, uh, you're, 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 not, you're not worrying about fitting inside 512 megabytes and working on seven-year-old technology. Um, so one of the uh, one of the things that I'm kind of like most excited by uh, is the uh, the way we're doing the flight model and the, the sort of physics simulation here. So um, so just to show you, so like here's here's my ship and it's modeled uh, it's a complete proper full rigid body physical simulation and actually it rotates and orient uh, you know it moves and maneuvers around uh, changes orientation all like a real spaceship would do. So uh, I know it looks like it's got wings, but basically what's happening is force, like, so here I'm yawing, you can see the thrusters, the vector thrusters are all sort of articulating and, and actually <coughs> generating forces in that direction. So if I'm going to pitch, you'll see them pitching and rolling and doing all that stuff. Uh, same if I'm like rolling, you'll see the, the thrust. And so as I'm flying around, what's happening is uh, the ship's sort of fly-by-wire system, so it's sort of set up very much like a F-35 would be, because obviously trying to figure all that out in space, you know, because you to actually go, OK, I've got to put a force on this part of my rigid body, and I have to put a force over here on this part of the rigid body, it's, I mean, that's just too much for any player to do, and it'd be too much for a human being to do. It's why an F-35 has a fly-by-wire system, because there's no way a real human pilot could actually fly it, because it's dynamically unstable, so the computers, like, change moving all the control surfaces all the time. And it's basically taking the input of the, of the pilot, saying, OK, well, he wants to pitch, he wants to roll, he wants to go here. And so that the philosophy of that is very much in, in this. And so what happens is your ship's computer, when you say, I say, I want to pitch, I, I tell, OK, I want to pitch. And, and, the, and the sort of flight computer goes, OK, uh, that means I need to put a force here and put a force here. And it actually talks to all the uh, thrusters on the ship. So this particular one has uh, eight, eight maneuvering jets, four on the top, right? And there's uh, four on the bottom down here. And uh, it, so it basically pulls them. It says, OK, I need a force over here. I need a force here. And which one of you can get there? And how quickly will it take you? And how much force can you give me? And then all the thrusters sort of give the information back to the, the flight computer. And the flight computer goes, OK, well, uh, all right, I crunched all the numbers. And I need you to go here. And I need you to go here. And I need you to go here. And what's really cool about that is that in the old school of making a, a wing commander, or a privateer, or a freelancer style game, you basically said, OK, this ship would roll at 30 degrees a second, or this would pitch at 40 degrees a second. Well, with this system, you, there's none of that. It actually doesn't have any conception of like what your roller pitch is. It's all based on what your mass is, what thrusters are, um, you know, kind of how quickly they can articulate, how much thrust they can deliver. And so what's really cool about that is that what that means is when you are, say, in, in, in a combat situation, and you actually get, you know, you get hit on your front top right thruster, uh, uh, or you get hit on your you know, back, uh, back bottom thruster or something, it will have a completely different effect on your sort of flight envelope. So they'll, you know, it, 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 and it's a level of fidelity that, that, that hasn't been done before. And the other thing that's really cool about that is that it really plays well into the, uh, the bigger sort of star citizen universe where you're sort of building and modifying your ship. Because A, uh, it means that you can have like a huge amount of possibilities in how you're building and customizing your ship. And it also means that uh, there's no particular strong, uh, you know, definite, this is how we're going to uh, win build. Because for instance, to give you an example, you could build a tank of a spaceship with lots of armor, and lots of shields, and heavy weapons. Cost you a bunch of money to build that. But someone who's a good pilot may have built a much lighter build that's really maneuverable. And yeah, if you manage if you hit this guy, then he'll probably blow up. But it's going to be pretty difficult to hit him. If he's a good pilot, maybe he can get 20 hits on you before you get one hit on him, and he takes you out. So there's a very much rock, paper, scissors space, because you know, if you add weight to your ship, it's going to affect your sort of performance envelope. So even just you know, in this situation, if you, you know, once you've fired a lot of your weapons or your, your missiles, you'll be slightly lighter. And, and 
We're also going to let you scope into it, so you don't have to do it, but if you want to, you can uh, adjust sort of your power uh, ratios or meters. So you know you can you can be in a tight uh, turning dogfight and you decide, okay, I'm going to take the risk and drop some power to my shields to put a bit more power to my thrusters to maybe try and get an extra degree or so in that turning battle. So I just think because it's system, it's built as a system, it's a it's a lot. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot more sort of flexible uh, and also has a lot more combinations. So in terms of an open persistent universe, or even in terms of playing the more Wing Commander style game, I think you're gonna, it's just it's going to open up a whole range of uh, strategies and combat uh, in the uh, in, in in space, right? So I, I think that's great, and that's something that you know obviously you can do with today's tech that I couldn't you couldn't have done. You know, when I was making the last games I was making, just because it's it's pretty processor intensive, but you know now you've got the horsepower to do it. Um, so let's see. I think just for fun, uh, there's my carrier gun. Um, I'm going to uh, bring a few enemy ships in. But this part's the sort of very final bit, so the full uh, uh, combat stuff's not all. Uh, well, the HUD and everything isn't fully in, but I thought it'd be fun to sort of see all the ships attacking the carrier, much like you saw in the in the um, in the, cine in the sort of cinematic sequence, which was obviously a lot of this, but staged with nice, taking the the, the best shots for it. Yeah. So it's just it's the same like level of detail on the uh, you know on the big carriers that you have the same thing. I mean you know the carrier actually has got you know I think this particular carrier has 115 turrets on it, and of course they're all uh, they all move they all articulate. I think there's four different types. There's the AA gun. There's a um, sort of a bigger sort of heavy duty ship to ship one, and then there's a, a, the equivalent of a, a, a Flanax um, sort of point defense system, and there's a there's a Missile turret, um, but again, like I'm saying, I mean, this is if you saw this cinematic sequence, this is pretty. This is all the same stuff. It's the same assets and everything else. Uh, and let me see if I can get. Uh, fortunately, my this is the bit where the the hut. Oh, oops, uh, Daisy. My hut. Yeah, I'm gonna get killed at somewhere if I go around there. My uh, the uh, the full hut targeting stuff isn't actually integrated in yet, so. Uh, uh, it's kind of hard for me to see who I'm shooting. He's going faster than me. That's not fair. Uh, all right. Well, I was hoping to blow one up for you, but uh, I think they've all kind of run away. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left, and so kind of what I wanted to do was um, uh, take some questions and sort of and just before I was going to do that, the, I was going to talk to you about kind of why I'm sort of showing what I'm showing now at this stage, um, because I'm actually showing you a build maybe a year before you typically would do so. So you know, in the old-fashioned uh, uh, sort of typical uh, publisher model, you would basically spend another year working on this, and then you would go to E3 and you would do an you'd do a reveal. And uh, uh, and then you know you sort of have your last year you'd lead up to, to releasing it, um, but part of uh, you know part of what I'm trying to do here is one uh, I'm coming back to make a game I really uh, I'm very focused on making it about uh, PC uh, you know I feel like the games that I made in the past were obviously uh, you know you know at the heart they were always PC games uh, I felt like you know one of the things that Wing Commander and the other games I made was all about sort of pushing uh, what you could do on the PC and sort of showing uh, sort of the aspiration and the dream of it all, and I sort of f felt like over the last year, few years, especially as a player, I you know I kind of feel like as a PC gamer, I'm kind of 
you know, underserved. I, I, I can either play ports of a console game. So I mean, I have a console, and if a game was built for console, I'd buy the console version. I don't buy the PC port of it because I'm getting a port of something that was built for you know, seven-year-old tech. Uh, so I don't feel like people are really pushing the PC uh, like they could. I think there's a lot of, uh, 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 I guess they're coming back to attack me, uh, a lot of uh, PC gamers that sort of feel like they would like to get, uh, that's my, uh, uh, my guess, anyway, that they would like to get something that really kind of shows off or pushes the hardware. And, um, and, and oh, I, there you are, I died um, and got killed by the, uh, the nasty enemies. Um, but uh, so, so uh, you know, I put this, I put this together uh, in a way that uh, I can make it uh, sort of outside the traditional publisher system because, uh, you know, most of uh, you know the big publishers aren't very interested in uh, building a PC-specific game, and they're also not particularly that interested in building something that's a sort of space sim game because you know it's a genre that hasn't been, uh, you know big for the last 10 years or so. Uh, I, I tend to think that I think the, the, the genre is as, uh, can be as vibrant and valuable as it always has been. It's just that there hasn't really been anything that's been particularly compelling uh, recently. Uh, and so that's kind of what my goal is, to sort of come back and say, hey, I'm going to do a PC game like the old Winkman as I did, which was if you've got a great uh, PC, this is really going to show it off. And you're not going to be able to get this experience anywhere else. And it's going to be immersive, and it's going to be a great uh, 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 you know, uh, game and, 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 and everything else. So, so as part of that, um, I'm, I've, uh, you know, I've, I've put together uh, a group of private investors. But as part of my deal with that is I've, to validate that people Want this kind of game? Don't mind. It, want a high-end PC game, not a not a sort of uh, you know free-to-play or a social game. Um, that we're going to do an element of uh, crowdfunding in addition to the financing, because obviously this is a much bigger budget than you would have in a typical small sort of crowdfunded game. But the, what the concept is that we're going to have a, a, a sort of limited number of the you know the people that really like this and really sort of believe in this uh, be part of the process. Much earlier than you would normally be. So you would, you know, you 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 in essence come in and sort of pre-buy your spaceship, and uh, then you're part of you you you're getting a lot more. Inf you're basically involved in the development process in terms of seeing what's actually going on and really being, uh, uh, you know, informed. Which I think if you've looked at the Roberts uh, Space Industry site, it, it's you know we definitely do that, and we're going to be doing more of that going forward. Uh, but you're also going to be playing. Uh, the game and builds much sooner than you would do if you were you're not doing this. So uh, you know the the full timeline to get the full big um, persistent universe and everything out is about two years. But about one year into it, we're going to have sort of the multiplayer build, that the alpha multiplayer build that you'll get to play, and then. About another 18 months in, there'll be sort of the alpha beta of the persistent uh, universe that you'll get to play if you're part of this early community that's sort of signing up early and, and, and saying, hey, you know what? I believe in space games. I believe in PC games. And I'd like to be part of this. And, uh, and so I'm kind of having announcing this now as part of the, I, I guess, in the old days, this would be my green light meeting with uh, you know, at EA or Microsoft or somewhere where I'd say, this is what I'm working on, and this is what I want to finish. Uh, so, uh, you know, is, you know, will you guys back me to finish it? And that's kind of what happens at a publisher. They just say, okay, yeah, that looks cool. We think we could sell X million copies, and so we'll we'll uh, we'll back you. And 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 all a publisher really is doing is it's guesstimate. It's basically saying I think there's people that will like this and want to pay for it. So that's kind of what um, I'm doing here. But I'm doing it to all you guys because. I mean, at the end of the day, you're the ones that would be playing it and want to play it. And I'm, I'm hoping that a lot of you have, uh, you know, want to be in this universe, because I do. And I, I kind of want to play this game. So, um, so I'm sort of saying, if, you, if, you, uh, if this is something you're excited by, then you know, please come to robertspaceindustries.com and uh, participate and, and support us. Um, so that's my pitch. I'm not very good at the pitch side of things. Um, uh, but we have about 10 minutes left, and I thought that it would be good to uh, uh, do Q&A for uh, if anyone has some questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. So I'll turn over to the, the question side. <laughs> Talk like someone in publishing. <laughs> so um, 
the maneuvering thrusters, can they be intentionally disabled to do like some of the Star Starbucks style maneuvers and like Battlestar? Yeah, so, so um, I mean, you know, uh, all, the co all the different pieces are separate components on uh, the ship, and so they can all be, uh, you know, you know they, they're all simulated and they're all damaged and all the rest of stuff, but you can also, uh, we're going to, it's kind of what I was saying, that there's a baseline of you, it'll fly for you, but you'll be able to, um, you'll be able to sort of switch off some parts. So for instance, you could like disable them so you could sort of go on a sort of slide and then you could turn them back in and then your ship would take over. So it, you know, the idea is there will be lots of moves and strategies in terms of how you dogfight. Because I kind of wanted, it's, it's actually one of the big challenges of a space game is how you, in a multiplayer fashion, add enough like detail and nuance to actually make it sort of challenging in terms of different strategies to, uh, to achieve different ends. Uh, and so that's kind of why I'm excited about that. And you're definitely going to be able to do that. Um, just back here. It almost sounds like, and just may make sure I've got this right, it, it almost sounds like you're taking a hybrid approach for the end game between EVE Online, where you've got economy driving things, and then a more traditional MMORPG, like, say, World of Warcraft or um, uh, Guild Wars, where you get to a certain point, and then you kind of have access to more story points. Is that accurate? Yeah, no, I'd say so. I mean, I think I think there's a there's a combination where I you know there's an attempt to try and do stuff on a procedural manner that uh, you know I, I couldn't do to the level. So I, I think you can sort of simulate systems, and if you simulate them really well, they're kind of cool. In the old days, it was pretty primitive in how you'd simulate them, so they, they, it wasn't that interesting. Now you can you can do some stuff. I even think on the MPC and AI side that could actually uh, be pretty interesting. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of a hybrid. So that so the idea is. The, the, you, you, you have the big universe that uh, you know, has a lot of uh, sort of procedural -esque elements to it, and then you're sort of spicing it up here and there with sort of narrative bits that you're dropping in. And, and it's sort of, I, I think it's a good combination for me. It's the sort of game I want because it sort of allows you to have the big open world, but then also sort of feels like it's got a bit of a personal touch, which is, you know, for me, that's, that's always important. I, I sort of feel like you have to be connected to the world um, to really sort of get lost in it. Okay, so then to expand on that, I have a coworker who I respect his opinions about MMORPGs very much, and he played uh, Bioware's Star Wars game, and he opined that its major downfall was that once you got to the end game, there really was no content, and they blew through the content, getting to that end game much quicker than Bioware anticipated. So you feel like this dynamic micro update system will kind of alleviate that? Oh, it's, yeah, totally. Syndrome? I mean, the, the, I mean, the the the, uh, the old Republic issue is that I mean, essentially, it's a it's an incredibly well executed single player game that millions of people can play, uh, and you know that in terms of updating content is uh, it's a nightmare. I mean, you just it's I mean, it's it's great content, but I mean, it requires a huge amount of work. So I think you're much better served in being smart about how you. Uh, set your, ga you know, like in the case of this, how you set your galaxy up, how you put different factions together, and you sort of put uh, systems in place that, you know, I mean, I'll give you an example. That, um, so, for instance, uh, you, know, we're, we're, you know, it's not just about having an economy. So we're sort of simulating, the idea is to simulate the galaxy like a, 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 like a real world would be. So, for instance, if you're trading close to Earth and the planet's near there, the, you know, right near the sort of center of the empire and there's a lot of uh, law and order and, and, and sort of military presence. So there isn't really an opportunity for other players to rip, you know, basically, you know, do PvP or, uh, you know, take out uh, new players. But if you're trading there, it's very safe as a merchant. But when you land, say, on Earth, um, you'll be paying landing tariffs and you'll be paying tariffs on the, on the goods you sell because someone has to pay for the infrastructure, someone has to pay for the, the law and order that's happening there. Now, of course, if you don't want to do that, there's other areas of the galaxy that don't have the same level of law and order that don't have any of that. But of course, obviously, they're a lot more risky because those are the areas that you know pirates aren't really, you know, there's no one keeping the pirates in check and everything else. So it's much like, you know, the idea is to sort of simulate this universe like a real world. So there's trades and, you know, there's, uh, there's you know, pluses and minuses to everything. And I think then when you start to do that and you put those tools in a world, then, uh, and you enable the player base to almost sort of help uh, keep it alive and, and create content, I think that you sort of can avoid um, 
the problems that you have with sort of the old republic. And, and to be honest with you, I mean, it's, you know, this is a privateer wing commander style, so it's not about getting to level 80 or anything. I mean, there is no idea of level 80 in this style of game. There is basically, you know, you earn money, you g upgrade your ship, which is sort of equivalent of your, your character, and then you can later on buy, uh, you know, say you, you can get an asteroid mining station, or you can get a private penthouse on one of the planets. But it's not about, you know, okay, I, I, I need a rush to get myself to a you know, level 80 and then what my end game is. It's, it's, a, it's a different sort of philosophy. And I think at the higher levels, it's going to be more about putting the players in opposition to each other and creating uh, divisions and rifts between the players and factions in such a way that they all sort of operate amongst each other, which is what, you know, the thing that EVE Online does very well. That's, that's, that's kind of how they keep that universe uh, going. I have a technical question about the, the network traffic that a game like this might generate. Uh, in a game like World of Warcraft, you don't, have to you don't have to share that much data between client and server. It's basically like, where's your character and what is he doing right now? But here, you mentioned that that capital ship has like 100 turrets, and something like that would have to be disseminated to every client. Have you run into any technical problems getting that data to flow freely and issues like that? Uh well, no, actually, I mean, it's funny you mention that because I, I would actually argue with you that the setup of this style of game is much easier to do than a World of Warcraft because in a World of Warcraft, uh, you know, you have whatever it is, 1,000, 2,000 people in your shard, and you've got to worry about all those people being in the same area. So, yes, the fidelity of simulating any individual person uh, isn't, isn't necessarily as high as something as this, but you've got a lot of them. Uh, so this is the way you should the way that you think about this on a multiplayer technical side. It's a lot closer to say Battlefield 3 uh, or World of Tanks. And the actual you know intent you know, the stuff the combat that you saw here in the multiplayer system, you know you won't be you can't be in a in a, in a, in a you know what we call a battle instance with a thousand players. So it's going to be you know like a, a freelancer or a battlefield where it's somewhere between say 60 and 100 and something players. But of course, you know space is big, right? So in the actual galactic sort of server level, all the player base is in it. You're not on different worlds or shards. It's just that if you're, f if you're flying out in space between planet A and planet B, and you, you know, the, the galactic server basically goes, OK, well, you're flying from planet A to planet B, and this other person is flying from this planet to this planet. They've intersected, and you know, they're going to be in conflict. So it, it creates a, an instance in space. And of course, space is huge. It's infinite. So there's no way in this system that you say, oh, I'm going to go to exactly this coordinate. It ba so basically, it creates these, these battle instances, and they exist for as long as the, you know, the conflict exists, and then it's gone. So, so it's just sort of think of the persistent galaxy being more like uh, a really smart matchmaking system built on top of what would happen in World of Tanks and, and Battlefield that's sort of keeping track of your overall status, what your location is, what the money you have, and all the rest of the stuff. But the sort of high fidelity like data traffic uh, for the combat stuff is sort of in those sort of temporary battle instances that is much more like a sort of, like I said, World of Tanks or Battlefield. Uh, how do you uh, think it's going to be like it, near Earth where it's going to be a very busy system, I would think, as far as handling these high poly art assets, or at least what's very high poly compared to what we see now? Um, when you are playing multiplayer and there's, say, 60 or so characters all interacting in that particular area where it's not creating that instance, that's pretty, that's persistent in your persistent world. Uh, okay, well, so, I mean, the, here's the other, see, the, the, the yeah, I'm giving some tricks away on, on, on the space side. But um, uh, there's a big advantage to making this kind of game over making a typical, say, uh, first person or third person game, is that you don't really have to sim, you know, the environment's pretty cheap, right? It's space. So you spend uh, you know, your processing power, your GPU power on the spaceship or the character. And then the size of the spaceships means that it won't, by the time you get in close enough to the 300,000 polys of the fighter you're in or the, the craft that you're in, um, it's pretty much filling the screen. So you're not going to be able to have 60 other ones all at that le level of resolution all on the screen at once. So what would happen is, yeah, you can have 60 people in there. But if you were close enough on one to have that level of resolution, the other ones are all being rendered at a much, much, much lower level of resolution. And that's sort of the advantage of these big objects, right? So it's different than if we were saying it was a first-person shooter game and we were having you know, uh, you know, 100 or 200 uh, characters running around shooting each other all at 100,000 polys, yeah, there would be a problem because you literally could get a lot of these characters all on the screen at once at that resolution. And uh, it, would, it would be you know, harder to push that data around. But because you're flying spaceships and spaceships have sort of size and volume, um, it's, you, know, you can't really fit that many of them on screen at once. So you sort of alleviate the, uh, the, the technical issue of 
you know, having too many polys uh, at one when everyone comes together in the same spot because there's just you know so many ships you can fit in a certain volume. That's kind of the way it works. Uh, oh. So you are one of the very few high-profile figures in the video games industry that has started in the video game industry, went to the movie industry as a producer, and now coming back. Uh, what would you say is the key thing that you and RSI are bringing to this project that other developers and publishers would say, you know, we have the movie industry experience, and you know, we're bringing the cinematic experience to you in this game. What would you say, you know, that you're bringing sets you apart from those claims? Uh, well, I, I think, I mean, I sort of um, hit on it a little earlier. I mean, I think the thing that I learned the most when I was, you know, sp spent about 10 years making movies is that there's a le there's an attention to detail, uh, and it's and it, by the way, it's not on things that you would that you would think are obvious at all. So you know, if you like, you're not really, you know, you're not making movies, you're not sort of into it. You sort of you sort of view the sort of high level stuff, the obvious stuff. But there's a huge amount of work that goes in on you know a, a whole bunch of really talented and creative people to put the tiny little nuances and details in, and it is actually those details and nuances that make that world feel more realized. And so then the actor's performance or whatever can live inside it. And I think that. Uh, on a, on a uh, game side, I feel that uh, you know bringing some of that attention to detail that you would use in films back into it, uh, you know, stepping it up another level will increase your immersion. Because for me, it's always about immersion. So uh, all I want to do is I want to play this game, and, and I don't even want to feel like I'm playing a game. I just want to feel like I'm lost in this world. Uh, and so uh, for me, uh, it's probably the, you know, the, the, like I said, the attention to detail. And then from a sort of more boring production process basis, there are, there are some, you know, there are, there are aspects of the film business that are silly. And there are also aspects of the film business that are pretty good. Uh, and they're very, very good at marshalling a large amount of people in a short period of time to achieve one unified creative vision. Uh, and it, that's actually quite impressive when you're on a movie set and you see you know, two or 300 people all operating in unison to deliver a combined vision. And they sort of do it in a very, or even if you think about visual effects in a movie, I mean, most of those big visual effects movies, you know, they have 2,000 shots to do and they deliver them. You know, they finish shooting and they've got six months or eight months to do all the shots. And uh, you know that's that's a huge challenge. I mean, in the game business, you know, you do a lot, you do similar work, but you know, you'll take two or three years to uh, do the same level of volume, and a lot of times it's not to the same level of detail. So I think on that side, there's there's some there's some good sort of techniques to sort of uh, you know adapt and use. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm I I fully think that the the game business uh, is the is going to be the sort of entertainment medium of the 21st century. We're just at the beginning of our industry. So you know, if you look at a film that was made in the 20s, it's very primitive compared to films that are made today. Uh, you know, because they sort of evolved from theater, so they're very static and the performance is very big. And then, you know, as you got closer to the 70s, it became more naturalistic. And I think that the game business is just like that. I mean, I think we're still figuring out how uh, to engage and how to immerse a player in a world or a universe. Um, and that's kind of part of the fun of it, is to you know, figure out the syntax and language is cool. I think I've got the time is up. Please wrap up on the front here. Is it? Oh, <laughs> apparently uh, the our site is uh, having millions of hits and is overloaded. So, everyone out there, please be patient um, uh, because it's it, hopefully I think it's worth it. Um, but um, it's great that there's so many people interested in it. But. Uh, We'll try and get it back up uh, when uh, I guess we can. So um, that's that's it. So thank you guys.